Thanks for being here. I'd like to get started. Uh, I'm Greg Rostin. I'm Deputy Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. Uh, and this is John Chauvin, who's the director, who's a little visually impaired right now, so I'm reading the script on his behalf. Um, so we, uh, on behalf of our co-sponsors, the, the, the Bill Lane Center for the American West and uh, Bruce Kane and David Kennedy, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth annual State of the West Symposium. This has been now our fourth time collaborating together uh, to bring a, together scholars on issues that are of importance to the American West, and the American West is broadly defined to be the North American West. Uh, so CEPR has st studies economic issues around the world, and we have all, all aspects of the economy, and the Bill Lane Center is dedicated to advancing scholarly and public understanding of the past, present, future of Western North America. And so this is, we think this has been a fantastic way to collaborate to talk about economic issues affecting uh, Western North America. It's a, the West is a driving force in the economy, both internationally and within the United States. And we're going to look at how that plays out today in some of the areas that are important to us, including water and the impact of AB 32, the California Global Warming Act. Uh, before, I, before I turn over the mic to John to introduce the first speaker of the day, uh, I'm going to just go through the flow of the day for a second. The first talk uh, will end around 1.15, and then at 1.45, we'll reconvene to start uh, the panel Moving Water in the West. And then after they finish, we're going to have the Global Warming Solutions Act panel, and that will bring us to 5.30. We're going to, have a, we're going to leave the room for an hour so that they can reset it for dinner and have a cocktail reception. And so when you leave this room, take everything with you at 5.30 and then come back. Uh, and then dinner will start at 6.30 uh, and we're going to hear from the governor of Nevada, Brian Sandoval. And the evening should be over by 9 p.m. So if you have any uh, questions, we have plenty of staff here to help you. The restrooms are out uh, in the, off the lobby. Um, as you notice, there are media and we're recording this. We record all of the panels. And so we hope this is going to be an informative and interesting day for everybody here. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to John Chauvin. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, our lunch speaker is Nariana Coach Lakota. Uh, he's the president of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, David Kennedy, my uh, co organizer, has an imperialist view of what's the American West. And so he decided that the uh, Minneapolis Fed, that's part of the West. Um, now, you can um, read in the program uh, a little bit about Nariana, where he went to school, what jobs he's had, and so forth. Uh, it didn't seem to make sense to me uh, to try to read that. First of all, I couldn't read it. Uh, and secondly, uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about him uh, as a colleague. Uh, he was a full professor in the economics department here. Uh, roughly a decade ago for several years. Uh, he was a wonderful colleague from everybody's perspective, from the uh, faculty's perspective, from the graduate student's perspective, from the undergraduate student's uh, perspective. He was a wonderful uh, researcher, a terrific collaborator, uh, really one of the best uh, members of our faculty, uh, and one of the um, biggest losses is uh, that we experienced in my 40 uh, two years or one years at uh, uh, Stanford was when uh, he decided to leave for personal uh, reasons. But um, it's wonderful to welcome him back uh, to what he calls the farm and what we all call the farm. And uh, he, he is a, a great person uh, that you, uh, well beyond what you would get by just reading the specifications uh, in, in here. And I think you'll see that in his talk today. So Nariana, welcome home. John, thanks so much for that uh, overly generous introduction. And, and it is a real pleasure to be back here. Um, I was mentioning to my lunching companions that this used to be an excellent parking lot. <laughs> but it really has turned out very nicely, I have to admit. Um, so uh, I, I want to uh, thank the organizers, uh, David and John, for the invitation to join you here today. Uh, I, I'll give you some background about my job as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, here in California, Minneapolis doesn't seem like the West, but we're on the 
very western edge of the bank of the Mississippi River, so I think we can count as, uh, uh, as the West. I'll then talk about two seemingly distinct topics that uh, nonetheless emerge from two related aspects of my job. The first topic is the Bakken oil boom that is underway in uh, western North Dakota and eastern Montana. The second topic is monetary policy, and specifically how the Federal Reserve is doing in terms of achieving its monetary policy goals. And at the end of my remarks, I look forward to taking your questions. Please note, though, that my uh, comments today reflect my own views and not necessarily those of my colleagues uh, in the Federal Reserve. So just a level set, I'm going to begin with some basics about the Federal Reserve System. I'd like to talk about the Fed and think about the Fed as a uniquely American institution. Now, what do, I, what do I mean when I say that? Well, relative to its counterparts around the world, the U.S. Central Bank is highly decentralized. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 regional reserve banks that, along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., make up the Federal Reserve System. Our bank serves as the headquarters uh, for Federal Reserve operations in the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve districts. Now, our district is really into the, into the American West because it includes the state of Montana, North and South Dakota, Northwestern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Eight times per year, the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, meets to make monetary policy. Now, all 12 presidents of the, of the uh, regional Federal Reserve Banks, including myself, and the governors of the Federal Reserve Board contribute to the deliberations about monetary policy. But the voting members of the committee uh, change from year to year. It consists only of the governors. They always vote every year. The president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York also votes every year. And then a rotating group of four other presidents. And this year, I'm one of those uh, four presidents. Uh, the last time I, I spoke at CEPR actually three years ago. So CEPR manages to get me every uh, time I'm a voter. So uh, the, 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 I think the, the structure of the FOMC mirrors the Federalist structure of our own country um, because the representatives from different regions of the country, the various presidents, have input into FOMC deliberations. Now this description of the Federal Reserve and how the FOMC works is a good motivation for the two topics that I, want, I plan to discuss today. So at, at each FOMC meeting, uh, Federal Reserve Bank presidents contribute to the discussion of monetary policy in part by commenting on economic conditions within their own districts. So Federal Reserve Bank staff economists work hard to track, understand, and communicate about their district's economies. My discussion of my first topic, the Bakken oil boom, builds on exactly that kind of work that's happening within my own Reserve Bank. Now, as I noted earlier, as a Reserve Bank president, I participate in FOMC meetings that formulate monetary policy for the country. And that participation is the second topic that I plan to, do, to discuss today, uh, the Federal Reserve's performance relative to its monetary policy objectives. So yeah, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'll talk first about the Bakken oil boom and um, something of, I think, immense economic interest that's happening within the boundaries of the Ninth District. And then I'll move on to talk about national uh, monetary policy um, and, and our, our performance relative to our, our, our goals. So with that background in mind, let me turn to my discussion of the Bakken oil boom. So the term the Bakken, which you may have heard, refers to a shale oil formation in northwestern North Dakota and in northeastern Montana. So you can see it behind me here. The, um, you know, this is basically just showing you the, the, oil, the oil production area in these, in these uh, two states. The real, uh, the heart, the Bakken oil field covers a large swath in North Dakota and a corner of Montana. If you actually we push northward, you would see actually push a little bit into Canada as well. But the heart of the Bakken, from the point of view of uh, American uh, economists, would, is around the city of Williston, uh, North Dakota. Correspondingly, most of the oil production in the Bakken is taking place in North Dakota. Now, as it turns out, oil fines are not actually uh, a new phenomenon in North Dakota. Oil deposits were originally discovered in North Dakota in 1951 in what is now known as the Williston Basin. Now following the run-up in the oil, price of oil in the 1970s, there was a flurry of drilling in the state during the late 1970s and early 1980s. And that, but that boom disappeared 
when oil prices collapsed in the, uh, in the mid-1980s. So by the mid-2000s, oil production in North Dakota was less than 100,000 barrels per day. That is less than 2% of total uh, U.S. oil production. So this is around, you know, and you'll, I'll show you the picture in a, in, a, in a few minutes, but this is around the mid-2000s, as I say, that uh, oil production in North Dakota was, uh, was very low relative to the, to, the, to the total in the U.S. What changed 10 years ago was technological innovation. That there was a combination of uh, the, the horizontal exploration of shale formations along with what's called hydraulic uh, fracturing or fracking. This process, I'm, I'm sure many of you in the room have heard about and probably much more expert about than I am. The process has revolutionized oil and gas production throughout the country and around the world. In the Bakken region in particular, um, this uh, technological change, the ability to, to drill, to, to uh, do uh, horizontal drilling and, and fracking, has meant that what was impenetrable rock is now a mother load of oil that encompasses nearly 15,000 square miles. So thanks to, the, uh, uh, state, uh, to, thanks to the Bakken, the state of North Dakota is currently producing over 1 million barrels of oil a day, over 10 times what it produced 10 years ago. So here's the, without further ado, this is the picture of what's going on with oil production. So what over 10 times what it produced 10 years ago and over seven times what it produced at the peak of the 1980s boom. So North Dakota has gone from producing about 2% of US oil production it's now responsible for an eighth of U.S. total crude oil production and over 1% of total world oil production. So this slide uh, shows a rapid increase in daily oil production in, uh, in, in, in North Dakota. And it's, um, you know, as I was describing, basically you see that this is go it doesn't go back all the way to the 80s. It only goes back to the 2000, but you see basically we're around 100,000 barrels a day until around 2006 when things take off. And you can see here, this is a, always a mistake for uh, Fed speakers, but I will leave my prepared text. And you, <laughs> you can see here that there's a little bit of a downward blip in oil production. And, and that, that's uh, related to the fact that oil prices actually went down pretty low during this period. Okay, so now we can also look forward to pro project forward. Uh, what's what's uh, what, now? This is the government of North Dakota's projections for sto state oil production, and these projections include anticipated production from what's called the Three Forks. The Three Forks is another la large shale formation which is located beneath the Bakken. So the Bakken is is. Uh, First, uh, and then even below that, there's more oil in what's called the Three Forks. And if you build on that, um, you can look and see what the, the, the projections are going to be. The main takeaway from this should be that um, we're, you, you're expected to have production going out for quite some time. So you look at peak here, you know, this is uh, really around in the late 2020s or so, so quite some time down the road. Now, so this is all this is all in terms of just what's going on in terms of the quantities of oil that's been produced in the past and, and, the, and the explosion of oil production. So what's happened in terms of the economy as a result of this? Now, by most usual economic metrics, the oil boom has been associated with a large improvement in the North Dakota economy. If we go back to 2006, per capita real gross state product in, in North Dakota, so essentially the equivalent of GDP, um, in, in North Dakota per person was about 10% lower in North Dakota than it was in the nation as a whole. Over the next seven years though, North Dakota per capita real GSP, gross state product, grew rapidly. So much so that by 2013, it was about 40% higher than U.S. per capita real GDP. I, I have to say this again because it is an amazing statistic. In 2006, North Dakota was 10% below the national per capita average of GDP. It is now 40% above. Now, the fiscal impact, so this is all just steps in per terms of income on, uh, or per, um, GDP or, uh, in, in, for, for North Dakotans, the fiscal impact in the state has been even more dramatic. 
So if you go back, uh, uh, North Dakota operates on a biannual basis for their state legislature. The 2003 to 2005 biennium, the state of North Dakota collected about $120 million in taxes from oil and gas production. That $120 million is projected to top $5 billion in the 2013 to 2015 biennium. Now, here in California, $5 billion may not sound like very much. But in North Dakota, it's a very large amount of money. It's about $7,000 for every man, woman, and child in the state. That's just the direct tax collections. More generally, the state's tax revenues have tripled in the past six years. Now, these are remarkable measures at the statewide level. But one of the things we've been, we've been struck by at Minneapolis Fed in our studies at the Bakken is we've, also, we've been struck by what might be called the localness of the Bakken's impact. <coughs> the localness impact phenomenon is depicted in terms of wages on this chart. So this is describing the growth, the, the, uh, the, uh, the evolution of wages, average weekly wages, by distance from the core Bakken counties. So the, the blue graph shows you what's happening to wages within the Bakken counties themselves. Now you go to the orange graph, and you see what's happening 0 to 100 miles away in terms of of, 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 of growth in, in uh, uh, average weekly wages. And you still see growth, right, certainly, but nowhere near as much as what you've seen in the, in the, uh, the Bakken counties. Uh, that are, uh, so we're just going uh, 100 miles away, and you're already seeing a diminution in impact according to what's happening to, 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 to wages. You get further than that, 100, 200 miles away, 200, 300 miles away, and you really start to see a die-off in the impact on wages. Now, to so an economist's point of view, this is very interesting because the fact that if you think about labor as being a very mobile uh, kind of input, you would have expected to see much tighter relationship. I, I would have thought, I'll just speak for myself, I would have thought you would have seen a much tighter relationship. But here we see, you know, even going out uh, uh, to, to, to uh, 200 miles or so, 200, 300 miles, you're really starting to see a real diminution in terms of the impact of what's happening on the price of labor. Now, all told, though, I would say that the, in terms of the usual economic metrics, the Bakken boom has been a big positive for the state of North Dakota. Nonetheless, and you'll be talking about, I, I, I suspect, some of these challenges in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of development, uh, the boom has created large challenges for the state. The increased production has been an influx of people and a spike in strains on existing infrastructure. Now, there are a myriad of, of ways to see those strains, and I'll just offer a few anecdotal examples that uh, is reported on our website. So one, one aspect of this is just in terms of population growth. Okay, so the, the North Dakota uh, Bakken areas, uh, one a growth expert was, uh, that we interviewed describes 1% to 3% to 3% population growth is robust. At 4 to 5%, things, in his words, are, are busting out of the seams. In McKenzie County, so this is in the, the heart of the Bakken area, the growth rate of the population is 8% per year and is expected to grow at that pace for 10 or more years. Okay. So this is, how can you possibly keep up with that kind of uh, population growth in terms of, in terms of infrastructure? So this, I, I, I should emphasize here, this is the average across the Bakken counties. There are more than, <laughs> more than one of those. So some, some counties are actually growing even faster this in terms of population. And this is the rest of North Dakota. Um, and uh, you know, population growth is close to 2%. And the rest of the United States, is, as I'm sure most of you know, is at, growing at around 0.9%. So North Dakota is certainly seeing an influx of population. But it's really here in the Bakken that you see an enormous increase in, the, in, in, in population. Now, one way this shows up in terms of, uh, in, in an economic sense, is in terms of prices, and in particular, the prices for shelter. So if you look at, and this is an amazing statistic, uh, rental rates in Williston um, reported to be the highest in the country at over $2,000 per month for an entry-level one-bedroom apartment. This is Williston, North Dakota. 
Rental rates in tickets in North Dakota were ranked uh, uh, fourth in the nation. So Dickinson is not marked. Oh, no, there it is. So there's Dickinson. Now, there's certainly some parts, I would suspect, in this part of the world where you can, uh, you're thinking 2,000 may not sound that bad. But in Williston, <laughs> but in Williston, this, this certainly sounds like a fairly high price. Now, so uh, the response to this has been in terms of trying to build, of course, and you get these kind of explosion in rents, people respond to that economic incentive. So, for example, in Williston, 49 perm permits were issued to build apartments in 2013. This contrasts, that's in one year, in 2013, this contrasts from the 2000 to 2006 period when no apartment building permits were issued in Williston. So another issue has been uh, what's called flaring. If you've had a, a, a chance to go out there, one of the things that strikes you is, uh, uh, especially at night, is all the flaring of natural gas you'll see from the wells. This is flaring is uh, releasing carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas is a byproduct of, of combustion. But recent state regulations that have been impacted, uh, enacted are expected to spur increases in gas capture and reduce the proportion of wells that are flaring gas. One of the key inputs into fracking is water. And it's become an increasingly uh, important issue as industries and communities vie for this key resource. So in the city of Williston alone, water upgrades over the next six years projected to cost $250 million. In total, new infrastructure will cost the city $625 million over, the, over, over that time. Now, smaller towns are especially feeling the infrastructure squeeze. The city of Arnegard, North Dakota, uh, if you haven't heard of it before, I hadn't heard of it before either. It has a, has a resident population of just over 100 people. But it now has a service population of over 1,600. It's still a small town, but it's grown by 16 times. They don't have public water. Their sewer system is overrun and outdated. Uh, they were less than underprepared, said one state official. So there's, I think this is an important part to keep in mind that this boom, which is you know, definitely delivered um, positives in terms of the usual economic uh, metrics, has created challenges as well. Nonetheless, I, I, I do have confidence in the ability of North, Dakota, of North Dakotans to solve them. One source of my confidence I already mentioned. It's a 40-fold increase in tax revenues from oil and gas production that the state has experienced. These revenues represent resources that can go a long way toward ameliorating the kind of infrastructure strains that I've mentioned. Now let me close my discussion of the Bakken boom by discussing what I see as the biggest opportunity and the challenge that the boom creates. Namely, the long-term development issues. Now, over the next 20 years, the world economy will continue to evolve technologically. Of course, we do not know exactly what course that evolution will take. But I suspect that has, as has been true over the past two centuries, the evolution of technology will continue to favor the better educated, and especially those who have acquired skills associated with science, technology, engineering, mathematics. How will the residents of the Bakken and North Dakota choose to engage with this process of global technological change over the next two to three decades. I think the windfall of the Bakken oil boom gives them the ability to answer this question in exciting ways that would have seemed impossible a decade ago. So that's a, what I wanted to say about my first topic, uh, to give you a feel of the, uh, what's happening in the Bakken. Let me now turn to my second topic, monetary policy. So what I'm going to do Sorry, I don't, want to, I, don't want to, or I don't want to sit my hand too much when I talk about them. Uh, I will describe the goals the FOMC seeks to achieve through its monetary policy choices. And I'll discuss how the committee has done in terms of achieving those goals over the past seven years, since the onset of the Great Recession in late 2007. And I'll close about talking my, about my outlook for the evolution of inflation, and then how that outlook affects my thinking about current monetary policy choices. So if you're going to talk about monetary policy goals for the Federal Reserve, the natural starting point is the Federal Reserve Act. And that's the law that Congress passed to create the, the, the Federal Reserve back in 1913. Through the Federal Reserve Act, Congress requires, excuse me, Congress, uh, Congress requires the Federal Reserve 
to make monetary policy so as to promote effectively the goals of max employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Now, most economists believe that if the Fed is able to achieve the first two goals, max employment and, and stable prices, it would achieve the third, moderate long-term interest rates. So monetary policymakers are typically described as having a dual mandate to promote price stability and to promote maximum employment. So that's what you get out of Congress is that's our, what we're supposed to do, promote maximum employment, promote price stability when we make monetary policy. Now, it, this is uh, it, it's a, the foundation for what we do when we, when we make monetary policy, but it doesn't address a lot of specifics. So in January 2012, in a key milestone in the evolution of the Fed's communications, the FOMC adopted a longer and more precise description of the long-run goals. So I'll call it this uh, the associated short but path-breaking document framework statement. It contains a lot of important ideas, and I, actually everyone, all Americans should read it, because I, you know, the monetary policy is very important for everybody in the economy, and this really is a very clear communication of what we're trying to achieve when we, we go about making monetary policy. But today I'll stress just two, two main elements. The first is the framework statement explicitly translates the words price stability into a longer run goal of a 2% annual inflation rate. And here the term inflation rate refers specifically to the uh, personal ex consumption expenditures or PCE inflation rate. This is a little bit different from the CPI, which you usually hear, the consumer price index that you usually hear about. Um, uh, basically, we've done a lot of study in the Fed. We feel this does a better job of capturing the prices, the growth of prices at, uh, uh, in, in, in the overall economy. The main thing I want to emphasize is this is a measure of the rate of increase of all the prices of all goods and services, including those related to food and energy. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about core inflation that takes out food and energy goods. And I'll explain why we do that in, in a few minutes. But when we talk about trying to achieve 2% inflation, it's for all goods and services, not just uh, uh, the, uh, not, not stripping out food and energy goods. I think this adoption of this 2% target is very important. It means that the American public need no longer guess about the intentions of the, of the FOMC, either on the upside or on the downside. 2% is our goal. The second piece of the framework set, which I think is important, is it describes how the committee weighs the two mandates, promoting max employment, promoting price stability, against one another. And I think it makes it a really important point that's too often missed in the conversation about monetary policy. And that is that the two mandates are typically complementary to one another. Monetary policy pushes employment and inflation in the same direction. We, if we, we provide stimulus, it pushes employment and inflation upward. If we take stimulus away, it pushes employment and inflation downward. But that's from the point that most shocks that hit the economy do the same thing. Most shocks that push employment down also tend to push inflation down over the medium run and vice versa. The Bakken, which I talked about, is a great example of this phenomenon. The fracking boom has driven up both employment and prices, most notably shelter prices, but uh, that's what I stress, but it's all, it all fits into a number of prices around the area. So monetary stimulus that's designed to help the FOMC achieve its employment goals will also help the FOMC achieve its inflation goals and vice versa. Okay, so that's the two things I wanted to, to, to stress about the, our goals. One is we're targeting 2% inflation um, and nothing, not, not something below that, not something above that, and that trying to, uh, uh, the, the two objectives of promoting maximum employment and promoting, promoting price stability are actually complement, typically complementary to one another. So those are objectives. And now I want to talk about how we've done relative to those objectives over the past few years. This performance provides a clear example of the complementarity of the two mandates that I've just mentioned. Okay, so I've been trying, desperate to show this slide, so now I'm going to turn to it. So in terms of the employment mandate, Labor market outcomes, while they've been improving, have been distressingly weak since 2007. So I, we can see this weak performance in a number of ways, but I'll use two particular metrics. One is uh, you hear about all the time, the unemployment rate. And the unemployment rate, so this is a, a graph of the unemployment rate going back to uh, the early 80s. And 
The gray shaded areas represent recession periods as dated by the National Bureau of Economic Research. The far right recession area is what's called the great, typically called the Great Recession. It starts in December 2007 and ends in, January, uh, in June of 2009. And you can see the unemployment rate was um, below 5% in the early part of 2007. But as, after the great, during the Great Recession, it zoomed upward. And it kept rising even after the, after the recession ended. And in the, uh, in the fall of 2009, it peaked at, at 10%. It's been coming down pretty steadily since then. And it's now down to 5.8%. To Now, I think, though, it's important. This is one metric, one, one lens through which to view, view the labor market. The way the labor, unemployment rate is calculated is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics asks people, do you have a job? And if you don't have a, 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 a so then if you have a job, you're counted as employed. Then they ask, if you don't have a job, have you looked for one in the past four weeks? And those people are called unemployed. And then the the unemployment rate is the, the fraction of people who are unemployed relative to the sum of the people who are employed and unemployed. That means the unemployment rate can come down for one of two reasons. One is because more people are becoming employed or because fewer people say they've looked for your job in the past four weeks. A, 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 a large amount of the decline that we've seen in the unemployment rate over the past five plus years has actually been coming from people saying that they're not uh, looking for uh, a job, they have not looked for a job in the past four weeks, and you can see this by looking at the fraction of people over the age of 16 who have a job. This picture going in, in during the recession again, this is the gray shaded area is the Great Recession. This period, it, in a lot of ways, it mirrors what happened in the previous chart. Right, you're down. This is just the uh, the inverse image. You're down here, zooms up. You're down here, and it collapses. That's just the uh, one was the unemployment rate going up. This is the employment of people who have a job is going down. This is around 60, over 63% the people have a job. Now down here, it's really closer to 58%. We've seen relatively little recovery in this picture compared to the picture I just showed you. So in this sense, the, the, frat, the unemployment rate is providing an overly optimistic perspective on the improvement in the labor market. Now, with that said, We've seen the last year. We've seen uh, a, a good, run, uh, uh, you know, some, some noticeable improvement. I would say in this fraction. If I had given this talk a year ago, it would have been very hard to see any improvement at all. Now we're up to 59.2 percent, when we're really down in the low 58s for much of the post-recession time frame. Now this is a little misleading to look at this. I mean, more than a little because of the de demographic issue. You know, the people who are over the age of 16. All, um, includes the baby boom. And the, the fraction of the, that group of people is going to be heading into retirement age, and we'd expect them to drop out of the labor force uh, and stop working as they, as they, they, they uh, start to hit, hit that retirement time, time frame. One of the ways we've started to try to strip that out of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, is, and other people do this as well, is to focus on people who are age 25 to 54. And here, you know, I think that, again, you see the same picture of you're, you're uh, above 80% right before the recession, collapse during the recession, and then you start to see improvement. I think you see the demographics are real because you see more of an improvement in this number, the employment ratio of 25 to 54, than I did in this one. But, again, I think the unemployment rate is providing an overly optimistic perspective on the degree of improvement we see in the labor market performance. So that's all on the employment front. What about inflation? So on the inflation front, this is PC inflation over the last, oh, I don't go back all the way to the 80s, um, but it, uh, going back to, the, to 2007. Since December 2007, since the Great Recession started, inflation has averaged 1.5% per year. Remember, our target is 2, so we've been averaging below that target that whole time. Now, over that time frame. One thing I want to point out in this picture, though, is I, I told you that sometimes people take out food and energy prices, uh, the, the prices of uh, food and energy, goods and services, and look at core inflation. And the reason they do that is they want to know where inflation is going to go. 
in the future. When we make monetary policy, we can't affect the prices of goods and services tomorrow or today. It's affecting the prices of goods and services with a one to two year lag. So we want to know where inflation is going to be heading. Core does a better job of telling us where inflation is going to go than, uh, than if we include energy, goods, and services. And you see just a great example of this in July. This is mid-2008. Um, I know the price of gas is well over $4 in this state at that time. And, um, but, and that shows up in the inflation rate. Uh, because oil and gasoline got, went up so much, you see inflation is at 4% at an annual rate here. This would not have been a good signal where inflation was going to go in the future, though. Gas prices collapsed, and oil prices collapsed during the, the, the latter part of 2008, and that mirror <laughs> shows up now in a very negative inflation rate. Core does a better job. It's not perfect, of course, but it does a better job of tracking what's going to be happening with, with, with inflation because energy movements in uh, energy goods, uh, gasoline in particular, very volatile, tends to be transitory. It doesn't tell you where inflation is going to be going. Now, where are we now? Inflation right now is at 1.4%. This is all goods and services, PC inflation. Um, I told you you want to be looking at core. If I looked at core instead uh, of, uh, of headline, so all goods and services, just took out the food and energy goods, we'd be at 1.5%. So inflation pressures remain very subdued in the U.S. relative to the FOMC's target. What's the takeaway from all this? The shock of 2007, the Great Recession, pushed both employment and inflation in the same direction, below our goals. So the two mandates have been entirely complementary over the past seven years. My monetary policy has been insufficiently accommodative to offset either the price or employment shock effects of this large shock. So I now want to turn to my inflation outlook and its implications for policy. Now, as you can see from the graph before you, Inflation has been low for a long time. Inflation tends to be highly persistent. And so this long stay below target, you see, especially more recently, but just over the whole time frame, suggests to me that it'll take some time for inflation to get back to 2%. My own benchmark outlook is that PC inflation will not rise back to 2% until 2018, so four years from now. The minutes from the September FOMC meeting note that the Board of Governors staff in Washington currently project that inflation will remain below 2% over the next few years. So this inflation outlook has important implications for my outlook for the appropriate evolution of monetary policy. Many observers have suggested that the FOMC should begin to tighten credit conditions by raising its target range for the Fed funds rate at some point in 2015. So there's a lot of conversation about that possibility. But given the lags associated with monetary policy, which I mentioned, the one to two year ahead lags, such a move would lower anticipated inflation over the following one to two years. So if you were going to raise rates in 2015, that's going to push inflation even further away from our 2% goal. So in my current outlook, it would, be a, it would be inappropriate for the FOMC to raise interest rates during 2015. So I want to make two comments about that conclusion. First, I've made no reference to the falling unemployment rate or the improvement in the employment population ratio. So the following unemployment rate, improvement in the employment population ratio, I've made no reference to those. I don't see a falling unemployment rate or an increasing employment population ratio as a reason to tighten policy unless that change is generating undue inflationary pressures. And the essence of my inflation outlook is I, that despite recent and anticipated falls in the unemployment rate, I don't see such pressures at this time. The second point is, of course, this conclusion is dependent on the data. My inflation outlook could rise. We could get information that would push it in that direction. And then my preferred date of interest rate liftoff would come forward in time, possibly into 2015. Let me wrap up and throw the floor open for questions. I've discussed two disparate topics, the Bakken oil boom and appropriate monetary policy. I say these topics are dis disparate, but I see them as connected. I don't form my views about appropriate monetary policy based on conditions in the Bakken. Um, I have to admit that if I did, I would reach, have different monetary policy conclusions. But the Bakken is a great example of what a booming economy looks like. It's an economy that is actually pushing the limits of available resources, not an economy that is operating well within, the well within those limits of available resources. 
It's an example that I have found highly instructive as I continue to think about the degree of economic slack left at the national level. Thank you for your attention, and I look, very much look forward to taking your questions. Great, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to start by opening the floor to the questions. Is there, a, are we doing microphones? Yes, so I'll point to you, but wait, wait for a microphone, please, and say who you are. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. This is Axel Merck. Um, you dissented recently, and you're showing, obviously, your, your inflation outlook here a little bit. Um, did you use the PC inflation here because that's the easiest to communicate, or is it indeed what you're looking at to set your own inflation target, or differently phrased, um, what is your favorite way of gauging future inflation expectations? Um, because, because of your statement, we reference certain things, and then how does that contrast with your colleagues? That would be great. Well, the contrast with my colleagues, I'll refer you to, you, refer you to their remarks. Um, <laughs> one of the, the benefits of Fed transparency is that it's very easy to ascertain what my colleagues think on, on various issues. Um, in terms of my own views, though, to, which, to, 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 to talk about that. So the, the, the personal consumption expenditure inflation rate, the PCE inflation rate, that's what uh, the, Fed, the FOMC has agreed is the way we're going to target inflation. So we target a 2% inflation rate in terms of that. Um, the consumer price index um, is, it tends to run a little higher than that, maybe about 0.3% higher than that, just because of the way the composition of goods and services within that. But this is what we target. Um, and you ask about how I formulate my, my expectations. I, you know, I try to use a variety of methods, as I think is appropriate, um, statistical models of various kinds. In my dissent last, uh, so last week, more than that, at the end of October, the FOMC met. And I, uh, they, they, the action the committee took at that time was to cut, reduce the flow of asset purchases. We were buying, uh, the committee was buying long-term assets at the rate of $15 billion a month. And the committee took the step of reducing that down to zero. I uh, descended from that decision um, because my, I uh, saw inflation remaining low, but also there were market-based measures of inflation expectations that, that had moved downward significant, uh, materially, in my view. And so what do I mean by market-based measures of inflation expectations? Basically, are financial instruments that are out there that, uh, that, that allow you to, to back out what uh, financial market participants are thinking about future inflation. For example, there's, uh, there, uh, the Treasury issues two kinds of bonds, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, which are indexed to inflation in terms of payoff, and then uh, bonds that are not. The difference in yields between those gives you a, vi a window into what uh, market participants are thinking about uh, inflation is going to be. Because right, that tells you how much they're demanding in, in, in return for because of inflation. Um, what we've seen recently is even longer term inflation, uh, market-based measures of inflation expectations. Uh, so you can back out what people are looking at in terms of 2019 to 2024, five years to 10 years out. Those have slipped. And so I think that I was concerned that that indicated a lack of confidence or in the and the credibility of our commitment to this 2% target I mentioned, that people might be thinking we're actually uh, willing to, to live with something less than that. And I thought we should take a step to, to address that. I'm glad you mentioned the, the inflation expectations, because I told, told my class, I said, here's what the inflation expectations, according to the market, is over the next, uh, over longer term. And it starts with a 2. It's relatively low uh, for 30 years out. Um, but what is interesting about your question was, how do you form expectations? Everyone else in this room can form expectations and then act on them, you actually can affect them <laughs> some, somewhat differently than the rest of us. So your expectations may be different about, you know, based on what you do as opposed to the rest of us. You know, it's the, I think it's, this is a, a really important point, Greg, that, you know, I, I don't, from the point of view of a monetary policy maker, inflation expectations are not some autonomous object that just moves by itself. We have the ability, as you say, through our actions, through our communications, to influence those expectations. And I was concerned that by reducing our flow of asset purchases at a time when people, market-based measures are, are coming down, and the picture looks like this for inflation, we're not sending that, we're not uh, providing the kind of support we needed to for inflation expectations. I think we have a question over here. 
Uh, my name is Matt Barger. Um, I was curious how much of your thinking is affected by the impact of the Fed on financial markets and concerns about uh, things like asset bubbles. So I've, I've given a number of speeches over the, the past uh, year and a half, I guess, about this topic. Um, and I, I think it's something that we, we have to keep in mind that um, the way I think about this is we've been given a dual mandate by Congress, which is to promote financial, uh, price stability and maximum employment. And, but I, I, I think we've seen, uh, unfortunately, in the, in, the, in the events of the, the past seven years, that um, financial instability can cause risks to our ability to achieve those mandated goals. And so I think we have to take account of those risks when we're, uh, we're formulating monetary policy. What does that mean? So uh, I think it's, that the problem is it's challenging to know what that means. So you'll hear a lot of suggestions that um, low uh, interest rates are, are uh, um, stimulating a search for yield that might be destabilizing. And there's an argument made to, to, to uh, we should raise, uh, some people have suggested we should be, should be uh, increasing interest rates as a result of that. We try to monitor that very closely in the Fed. You know, how much, how much are we seeing of that kind of behavior? How much uh, is that going to be? And the, the question I ask myself is, what kind of risk is that creating for my forecast to inflation and unemployment? Right now, at this point, I don't think those risks are sufficiently material to influence my decision making about monetary policy. But as we move forward in time, I, you know, I think this is something we have to keep, keep our eye on. The thing I would say is that relative to, say, 2005, nine years ago, our thinking on this, our monitoring, the work that goes on at the system level is just uh, much more advanced. And so I think we have a much better, um, uh, I I'm not going to try to claim it's perfect by any means, but we, I think we have a much better feel for these kinds of uh, potential sources of instability than we would have been in 2005. Another question over there? Wait, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wonder, with regard to your inflation targets, what do you do about the strength of the dollar or the lack thereof? It seems like it would be outside your control. You know, the, the, the dollar is, uh, in, the, in the U.S. Uh, system, the dollar is the, the, the purview of the, tr the Department of the Treasury and not in the, uh, the, uh, the, the Federal Reserve. Uh, so, you know, certainly our decisions, uh, when we think about the modeling of our decisions, um, they go through, it goes through a variety of mechanisms, and, and one is uh, through the dollar, but it's through a variety of other mechanisms as, as well. But yeah, the, the, the value, you know, the decision making about the value of the dollar, such as at the, at the, the governmental level, is in the purview of the Treasury. Right. One in the back, and then we'll come to the front over here. Uh, to give you a perspective on the parking lot, this was also, and to date me, where the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Tactical Squad used to come <laughs> to. Uh, make sure that we Stanford students behaved ourselves. And this sort of leads into a question, and it's more on the fiscal side than the monetary side. Given the enormous disparity of wealth, uh, maybe not experienced in North Dakota or Silicon Valley, what's your sense as an economist as to how that might get uh, reconciled without having uh, significant trouble? You know, I it's this is a great question about uh, that I think is receiving a lot uh, a lot of attention. Um, you know, I, I I think the best I can you know first of all it's 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 a you know it's just a question about that I think um, Americans should be thinking about. It's a very important question to be thinking about is, is about the distribution of wealth. I think it's important to have the right kinds of facts at our disposal when we do that. And so one of the things we've done at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis to contribute to that is. Our annual report essay that was done in 2013 um, tracks, uh, I th I, looks at the distribution of income before and after tax and transfers. For, but uh, looking more at the bottom at the income distribution as opposed to the top. So a lot of the conversation you hear about is the top 1%, how, is it, how are they doing, or the top 0.1%. Our essay focuses more on the median, so the, the middle of the income distribution relative to the bottom quartile or so. And I think one of the main takeaways from that is you see a, a growth in income inequality there, and that you can tell a number of stories for that. Probably, uh, I think, differences in education, edu rates of growth rates of educational attainment are playing a key role. 
But after tax and transfers, uh, that, uh, the increase in inequality is much more diminished. So that's telling you a story where um, there's been a essentially an, a response increase in inequality to impact uh, um, income inequality. This is all the bottom, bottom end, though, not, not so much of what's uh, received the attention at the top. Um, so that's, that's I, I think the best we can do with the Federal Reserve on this, one of the things we're very good at is we're apolitical and we provide analytics. And that's, I think, the, the benefit of this essay from the Federal Reserve is one of them. Uh, two questions. One is, what do you think is the danger of the dollar's loss as an international reserve? And the under, unrelated question is, you show that the total employment rate is down from about 63% of the population, perhaps 59%. To what factors do you describe that as opposed to unduly uh, generous welfare benefits? or a change in the thinking of the labor force. So let me talk about the, the second question first, about the decline in the employment population ratio. I, I, I think that there's a, probably a number of different possibilities underlying that. Um, some, of the, some of the causes, though, that people point to as being structural in nature would be uh, would, be, there are would be things that would uh, reduce the supply of labor, reduce the willingness of people to work. And the way that should manifest itself is upward push pressure on, on wages. If you didn't have as many people willing to work, and that's what was causing the, the increase in the employment population ratio, you should see upward pressure on wages and therefore it threw on it to inflation. I, I haven't shown you any wage data, but I can, if I showed you wage growth data, it would look very underwhelming. So you just don't see that being the, the, being the heart of the matter. I think the, so what is that take, what's my takeaway from this? We have insufficient demand for the goods and services in this country to utilize um, the human resources that are available to our country. Don't have enough demand for goods and services. And that's what that inflation number is telling you. If that was closer to 2%, uh, then you know, we could have more of a conversation about what, uh, what, what are the supply factors going on. If you look at this, these numbers to me tell me that it, the, the demand is playing a major role. On the reserve currency, um, I, uh, I, you know, I, 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 over the time horizon that I would think about monetary policy the next year, two, year to three years out, I don't think this is a material issue for us. Um, going forward, I think it's, uh, uh, this is going to depend on good decision making by a wide variety of, of policy makers, um, you know, not, not just the Federal Reserve. I think we have time for one more question, then Narayan has got to catch an airplane. Yeah. Um, John, do you want to, Rosanna, can you get John Gunn? Sure. Let's just assume, yeah. let's just assume that it's sort of obvious to the most casual of observer, wage rates are going up, whatever, that we should raise interest rates. How do you do that? How do we raise interest rates? Yeah. So um, right now, the way, I, I, I'm trying to think about, I, I could teach a course on this, so I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> probably well, Daryl Ask the right person then. <laughs> um, yeah, but let me, uh, so, so I'll try to, try, to, try to get think about the right concise answer. The concise answer to this is. Your plane has been delayed, so you do have yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the concise answer to this is that um, we pay interest on excess reserves to, uh, to, to depository institutions, to banks. And if we raise those interest on excess reserves, that's going to put upward pressure on interest rates throughout the whole economy and uh, through, through arbitrage forces. So that's the way we're going to be raising interest rates uh, now. In the past, which is what, uh, and this is what I was trying to think through in the way to answer your question, we would have uh, engaged in open market operations um, and, and thereby uh, uh, try to influence the, uh, that would have been our, our way to influence the, uh, the interest rates throughout the economy by exchanging one kind of asset for another, um, but we're not going to be doing that going forward. In the, in the, in the near in the near term, we're going to be raising interest rates on excess reserves. Already exists how, how much you would be paying out to foreign banks if you raise interest rates on excess reserves. Does that present any political problem? 
you know, I, I'm, I'm not a politician. I, I think about this as, as uh, <laughs> I, I'm given a technocratic not objective, which is to, to uh, hit these okay. inflation targets and employment targets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.